And we are live for episode nine. Nine. Protein 101. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Lowering the Barrier, the podcast. I'm Alex. And I'm Maddie. And today we are going to be talking about protein. I think a lot of you are probably very familiar with protein. You know, if you are listening to this podcast, you're probably relatively, you know, concerned and involved with your health and fitness specifically and nutrition. And protein is a, it's a big pillar of that. It's not like we're talking about something, you know, minor, like, Mm -hmm. like this isn't a podcast on potassium. That'd be pretty specific. That'd be pretty specific, but maybe we'll do that someday, but nope, not today. Today we are talking about protein. (laughs) Before we get into that, let's do our, let's do our little intro. Let's talk about the A-team, my group Mm -hmm. training program with a seven day free trial. At the time that this podcast episode comes out, we are starting week one of the new cycle. So yeah, if you ever want to check it out, just check it out. <laughs> and if you use code Leo 10, you'll get 10% off for one month. In addition to the seven day free trial. How long is that valid for? I haven't put an expiration date oh. on it, but let's just say a week. Just in case someone's listening. Right. Yeah. Like a year down the yeah. road. Once we hit the mainstream, once we have Andrew Huberman and Joe Rogan shaking in their boots for that number one spot. Just overall? Yeah. I was like, those are, I think, different genres. Joe Rogan, I think it would be a different genre. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, we also have Forward Forever. The next sign up is, when is it? Sometime in March? Yeah, I don't remember the exact date off nope. the top of my head. Me I think mid-March. Mid-March. Yeah, shoot me a DM if you're curious about that. Uh, you can follow me at Alex Timmy Fitness. Or me at Meals with Maddie. And if you enjoyed this episode or enjoy the podcast in general, please give it a five-star rating. And if you'd be so inclined, a screenshot and share on your Instagram story and tag us. Mm-hmm. We absolutely love when people do that. It always gets a reshare, at least from me. Yeah. Maddie, I think you share it. Mm-hmm. Cool. I think so. I think so too. <laughs> All right. What's been up? What have we been up to lately? Maddie's 20 weeks pregnant. Yeah, today, officially 20 weeks, so we're halfway through. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, Leo just turned three years old. He did. So. Big, big celebration. Big birthday boy. Yep. Really proud of him. I, my friend Bennett just ran a 25K. He's a big runner. So he just did that. He was a sub nine minute pace, which it's is insane. very, very fast. And he couldn't really walk that well after, but he was fine. He was fine. I think his legs were just a little sore. Let's see. What else have we been up to? Still Helldivers 2. Still playing chess. I hit a 700 rating in chess. Very excited about that. Thank you. I'm shooting for 1,000 by end of year. Mm -hmm. I started like January like 3rd or something like that playing chess. And I was at 490. Well, technically it was like 260, but then I played one game and it jumped to 490. Mm Mm-hmm. But I was at 490, and so it's been a steady climb. So we're about a month, two, almost two months in, about a month and a half, two, two months in now. And uh, yeah, up to 700. So end goal is, not end goal, but goal by end of year is 1,000. I Honestly, I think I'll clear that by like June at the latest yeah. at this point. Obviously, yeah. it'll go a little bit slower. You know, the higher you get up, the harder it gets. But that's been a lot of fun. A lot I didn't realize about chess. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of learning there. What about you? Are you reading anything? Watch anything? Oh yeah, I'm reading a couple things. I am. Um, I have like four books going right now. Mm-hmm. I tend. I have a goal of reading on average one book per week. Mm-hmm. So I think. I think I might be a little shy of that. I think I've read seven books so far for the year, maybe eight. Okay. So I think we're we're pretty close on track with that. Yeah. Right now I'm reading a book called Bumpin, which is pregnancy related. Sounds like it. Yep. I'm sure you could figure that out. And then I'm also reading Building a Story Brand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I am really close to like being done with that. I'm surprised I haven't finished it yet, but I guess I just put it on the back burner for a second there. That's a phenomenal book. You told my dad about that book. Yeah. And he bought like 10 copies. Yeah. Yeah. I highly recommend if you have, if you are in business or care about marketing, even if you're not necessarily an entrepreneur yourself, but if you work in that space, I think it's a really interesting and useful book. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, You want to get into it now? I would love to. Okay. So protein, I think the first kind of overarching question that, you know, 
anytime I start talking about a topic is you have to have a broad spectrum of like, what is it? And mm -hmm. so very simply, let's just start off with the question, what is protein? What do you think protein is? I mean, when I just think about protein, I just think about it as like meat yep. or like the food source protein. Yeah. I don't really consider the specific science of it. I know it's an amino acid. Yeah. Made of amino acids. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. I know it's important for various muscle building things. Yep. So it's, I think that's what most people yeah. kind of see it as is like muscle building. Yeah. So protein is a large molecule made up of individual amino acids. So if you've heard of amino acids, essential amino acids, branch chain amino acids, BCAAs, we're going to talk about that. And actually, can you write a note down in the notes a little bit further down? Just, just type in BCAA somewhere near the bottom. That'd be great because I would like to talk about that. So these amino acids are often referred to as the building blocks of life. Uh, protein plays a very crucial role in basically every single bodily function from building and repairing tissues, muscle, sure, hair, skin, nails, sure, arterial walls, yep. So there's a lot to it that you need to, it is an essential nutrient. You need to eat it. If we didn't eat it, we would cease to exist. Be pretty tough. We would not live anymore. It also helps in making hormones and enzymes. So important there. The way I want you, listener, to think about amino acids and protein as a whole is, every, you know, every, every, Every gram of protein is made up of individual amino acids. Every every bit of protein. A gram is an arbitrary measurement sure. here. But, and think about building a Lego sculpture. Let's say we wanted to build a, a Lego house. So we would need, you know, the, the bricks for the literal bricks of the house. We would need a door. We may need a roof. We may need a chimney, hypothetically. We may need windows. And all these different things, they, they are in various shapes and sizes. They are not all red square brick, right? Similarly, you need a bunch of amino acids. You know, you need a bunch of Lego pieces to finish a build. You need a bunch of amino acids to kind of fulfill the body's requirements. And so our body can create some, but not all of them. They can create some, it can create some amino acids, but not all of them. The ones that we cannot create are called essential amino acids. And so this is where that supplement EAAs come in, essential amino acids. Those, that is a, a combination of all the amino acids that our body cannot cre create on its own. Now for a protein source to be considered complete, it must contain all of the essential amino acids. And so, you know, some people have maybe heard like a complete protein versus incomplete protein. Usually this is around vegetarian or mm -hmm. vegan, like plant sources. Almost all plant proteins are incomplete. They do not contain all the amino acids that our body needs. And so I think a logical question to go on from there is, okay, then how do, how are vegetarians and vegans alive? <laughs> <laughs> and it's because while one source is not a complete protein, most vegetarians and vegans are not eating just one, one source. source. They're not just having beans. They're not just mm -hmm. having rice. They're not just having edamame. They're not just having soy, etc. They're mixing and matching all of these things. And so as you mix and match, then you can get a complete protein overall, just not individual sources. Animal-based proteins are all complete. Meat is made of protein, you know, like our muscles made of protein. So when we eat it, I mean, we just break down that protein into individual amino acids and, you know, there we go. All right. Any, anything that I didn't touch on there that did that all make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great, good starting point. Yeah. All right. What foods contain protein? So let's break it down into animal sources and then plant sources. So animal sources, this is pretty straightforward meat, like beef, chicken, turkey, fish, yep. all of that. Very good. And then eggs and then dairy products, milk, yogurt, cheese. Yep. I'm sure I'm forgetting things here. Sure. Definitely. But those are like the big rocks. Yeah. But I'm trying to think like rack my brain. What, am, what could we be missing here? Yeah. I mean, so while we're talking about this, there's mm -hmm. also lots of foods that may have some 
yeah. random amount of protein, but that yep. doesn't necessarily mean that they are a solid uh, protein source. Like yes. they'll still contribute to your total protein intake, but you have to think about, so one of the big things, uh, when we're for life, I'm going to say for life is managing our energy intake or our calorie intake. You can use energy and calories interchangeably. And one of the really important things there is we're not eating too little and mm -hmm. we're not eating too much. And we don't have to be super exact. Like if somebody's maintenance calories are 2,500, give or take, it's not like you need to eat 2,500. And if you eat 2,499, you're just, you're screwed. And if you <laughs> eat 2,501, you're screwed. Like you're going to burn a little bit more energy some days because you're moving more and you're going to burn a little bit less energy some days. And so we really have to like zoom out and look at averages. Mm -hmm. Energy intake isn't super acute where you need to micromanage it every day. Protein intake, a little bit more important. Mm -hmm. Again, you don't have to be super exact with this stuff, but so some, some protein sources are just going to be leaner. And when we say yeah. leaner, they are higher protein on a per calorie basis. Mm -hmm. So protein is four calories per gram. Uh, so if you had, let's say you had a protein source, hypothetically, that was like a hundred calories, but it had 20 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. That means 80 out of the 100 calories are coming from protein. That would be a very lean protein source mm -hmm. versus something like peanut butter. Not a good protein source. No. Very bad protein source. Can you look up the calories on peanut butter? Like the, the calories versus protein content? Just look up like a nutrition label. While you do that, I'm going to go through some plant sources. So some plant sources include tofu, tempeh, legumes, such as beans, lentils, and chickpeas, nuts and seeds, quinoa, oats, whole wheat bread, soybeans, just to name a few. Did you got a... I'm get pulling a, up Jif. Okay. Yep. I feel like that's a common... That's like the brand, I feel like. That's like yeah. a very common brand. So two, two tablespoons, 33 grams, would be 190 calories. And out of that 190 calories, you're looking at 16 grams of fat and seven grams of protein. Wow. And eight grams of carbs. So yeah. when you're looking at the overall... And that's only for two tablespoons, yes. 190 calories. Yeah. Protein is one that if you are watching your calories and you are not measuring things out with a food scale and you eat peanut butter, start doing that. Because a lot of people, they'll do a spoonful of peanut butter and they'll just be like, yeah, it's about a tablespoon. They are grossly over-exaggerating. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, underestimating. Yeah. So what I would say, a good way to do this is the food scale trick mm -hmm. where you put a jar on the food scale, you zero it out, and then you take out however much you're going to eat. Mm -hmm. And the negative number represents how much you ate. Yeah. It's such a simple like trick or hack, mm -hmm. but one that not enough, every time I say that one, people are like, wait a second. Yeah. It's so much easier than like putting down a plate or a bowl and then zeroing it out and then adding it to the bowl. You just look at the negative number of what you remove from the jar, the container. Yeah. You can do this with like sauce or ketchup. You know, you put the bottle of ketchup down, zero it out, put your ketchup on the plate or on your fries or on your burger. And then how the negative number, boom, there you go. That's what you track. That is a, that's like a, that's like a, that's a life hack in terms yeah. of like tracking and food skill usage. Yeah. That's a great one. So, oh, and then one more protein source, protein powders. Yeah. Bars, shakes, mm -hmm. pre-made shakes, you know, yeah. things like that. Going off of that, protein powders can be animal based or yep. plant based. So yeah. Yep. There's definitely options there. Yeah, definitely. Now, a question that I get a lot that isn't written in our outline here, but that I get often is. Is it bad to consume my protein intake from plant or from uh, protein powders? Mm -hmm. Do you know the answer to that? I'm sure you've heard me rattle it off. Yeah, I've definitely heard you talk about it. I guess I couldn't give like a an exact yes or no. Yeah. On so, it. so it's totally fine. Protein powder, like let's say it's whey protein, or mm -hmm. or if it's like pea protein, it doesn't really matter. But it's just a powdered food. Yeah. And so it is still food. It's not like. I think a lot of people, they say the words like fake food and they don't really <laughs> understand what that means. Like a fake food is a plastic variation of the food that we would let our children play with. Right. That is fake food. Frosted flakes are not a fake food. <laughs> <laughs> they are still very much food. So one of the, you know, the, the question is, is can you get, you know, more of your protein or less of your protein from powder? And like, it's not necessarily going to be a bad thing, but other protein sources, like let's say you're eating meat, let's say you're eating dairy, let's say you're eating quinoa or tofu or whatever it is, 
you are going to be getting other nutrients, Mm -hmm. not just the protein. So like, let's say it's tofu or uh, quinoa or something like that. You're going to be getting some fiber in there. If it is, you know, like an animal-based product, there are a host of micronutrients that you're going to be getting along with it that don't usually come with protein powder. And Mm -hmm. so that's like the really main thing is if you were to get 100, which would be psychotic, but if you were to get 100% of your protein intake from protein powder, you would just be missing out on a lot of the micronutrients that you might otherwise be getting. But in terms of using it to supplement your protein intake, totally, totally fine. I really think I'm going to basically say almost no one is getting 80% plus of their protein intake from protein powder, it's usually like an extra 20 to 40 grams per day. Sure. If you need it for more than that, I would suggest adjusting your protein intake, you know, and one of the easiest ways to increase the amount of protein that you're getting in your diet is don't worry about adding a bunch of new foods. Mm -hmm. You know, don't worry about any like protein snacks or anything like that. Just increase the protein portion sizes at meals you're already eating. So if you are eating three ounces of chicken, for example, at lunch or dinner, Mm -hmm. instead eat five or six ounces. Yeah. And a good uh, rule of thumb is your palm. Now I know everybody's palms are slightly different, but roughly your palm, that size is about three to four ounces of meat. So you can kind of use that to gauge, you know, obviously it'd be great if you're using a food scale, if you're really dialed into tracking, but if you're not somebody who wants to track, that's totally fine too. Just, you know, look at your palm and be like, okay, that's about three to four ounces. I should have like one or two palms then, you know, 1.5 palms. It's a really easy way to do it. Okay. Next up, let's talk about some of our favorite high protein snacks. Even though I just said like, don't rely on snacks and I stand by that. Yeah. I I feel like I have a little bit of a tangent to go go on this. Let's do it. I, because we both get this question a lot about like high protein snacks. And while I am all for, if you need to supplement your protein target through snacks, I'm all for it. Like I, I totally think that's valid. You know, like if you're not getting your daily goal just from meals alone, adding it in through snacks, totally valid. However, I think people get really hung up on this. I have to have 15, 20, 25 grams of protein at every snack. That is very limiting on what snacks you can kind of have. So I just, I think people maybe get really hung up on like, I need a high protein snack or what high protein snacks are out there. I also think you should consider what what is your protein target and how many calories do you want to spend on a snack and how many grams of protein are you trying to get in that snack? Because again, you're starting to really limit yourself. That's, that's the basis yeah. of my tangent, I yeah. guess. My recommendation would be if you, if there's like a snack that you really want to enjoy, go ahead and just try and get your protein from your meals. The other thing is I think we spend so much time talking about high protein snacks. I think if you looked at your diet logs, you would actually benefit more from high fiber snacks. But that's that. that's probably for a different day. I agree with that. <laughs> but yeah, we can talk about favorite high protein snacks now. So when whenever I'm looking for a high protein snack, it's usually you know, like you said, you have to be calorie conscious because a lot of the people that are listening to this, I'm sure you know, maybe I hesitate to say majority because I just don't necessarily know. know. But a lot of people that are following me or listening to me, they have weight loss goals. Mm -hmm. And so with that in mind, I always recommend prioritizing hunger. And what I mean by that is if you are, let's look at hunger on a scale of one to 10. 10 is like you're stuffed. Mm -hmm. And one is you are ravenous. And you can flip that scale. It doesn't really matter. But let's just use that for argument's sake. One is you're ravenous. 10 is you're stuffed. If you eat like one or two hard boiled eggs and you're at like a three, like you're really hungry, that's going to push the the hunger scale up by like one point. Yeah. You may be going to a four, maybe even a five. And honest to God, sometimes when you eat a little bit, you get hungrier. Yeah. So you might go to a two. Sure. And so what I would say is if you are going to be incorporating high protein snacks and you are just like you know, maybe you had a smaller lunch or something like that and it's 3 p.m. and you're not done with work yet and you're not going to eat till six. So you just want like a little 3 p.m. thing, dude, make it a meal. 
and make yeah. it a meal with like you can still do hard boiled eggs. Sure. You could do two, three, four hard boiled eggs. Okay, that's a lot of <laughs> that's a like, lot of eggs. It would just be like a lot of calories <laughs> sure. for the amount of protein you're getting. Hard boiled eggs is one of the high protein snacks that I enjoy, but it yeah. is not like a super, super, super lean one. Like a like a Greek yogurt, like Oikos Triple Zero is one mm-hmm. that I've been really loving. That is such a lean protein source. I'm pretty sure it's 90 calories and 15 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. So two of those, you're getting 30 grams of protein for 180 calories. Throw in like a a small handful of nuts, which are very calorie dense, but solid healthy fats. Throw in maybe just like a small, please pre-portion this (laughs) uh, bit of pretzel or something like that. You know, don't just mindlessly, mindlessly snack on nuts. They are so calorie dense. Delicious though. You can't relate. Yeah. I'm allergic to nuts if you guys didn't know. <laughs> okay. So some of my high favorite high protein snacks, Greek yogurt, especially like I love the strawberry Chobani. I love throwing strawberries in with that to mm-hmm. like really bulk up the food volume. And again, reduce my hunger. Cottage cheese. I recently switched to good culture after going with Daisy for a long time. Cause I've been hearing about good culture for so long. Really good. Do you notice a difference? I do notice. A you difference. prefer it? I do prefer it. That's good and to know. Costco started carrying it, so that's yeah. really nice because you can just get a giant tub of it, and it's like it is a bit more expensive, but you know when Costco has it, it makes it so much more reasonable. Yeah. Fair Life protein shakes. That is my go-to protein. Mm-hmm. Ninja Creamy. Yep. When we are uh, Ninja Creamy is like an ice cream maker device thing, and you can just you can make anything into ice cream with that thing, and mm-hmm. so we do these like high protein. They're like 300 calories and like 30 grams of protein for a yeah. giant pint, pint of ice cream. So that's nice. Beef jerky, solid one. Very, very lean option. Hard boiled eggs, not so lean, but, you know, can be easy to uh, to grab. They're going to be like 70, 80, 90 calories and then six grams of protein, six, seven grams of protein, probably about six. And then edamame. These are obviously all animal based so far. So I want to throw in one plant, you know, source. Edamame is okay. One mm-hmm. cup is 188 calories, 18 grams of protein, but eight grams of fiber. So that's one thing that vegetarians and vegans have going for them. They're just they're just crushing yeah. the fiber game. Yeah, they are. They're just crushing it. So that's, that's good for them. Yeah. Before we move on, I actually don't eat any of those things nope. other than the Fairlife protein shakes. I'll enjoy those every once in a while. Again, this kind of goes back to that whole conversation of like, Sometimes we can relax on the, like, I need a high protein snack. Some things that I do if I think that I'm a little low in my protein, typically I hit my protein through my meals. meals. Yeah. But a couple other ideas, air fryer, lightly breaded chicken strips or like the frozen chicken, you know, the ones I have right now are 130 calories for I think 13, 14 grams of protein. That's a decent, quick sort of thing to add in. Deli meat, if you eat like ham, sometimes I just snack on (laughs) deli meat Mm. or like putting together little snack trays that have deli meat with some pretzels or crackers. You know what I like doing is I'll take like a slice of like Havarti or something like that. Yep. And then I'll put like a a slice of ham in there and then I'll just roll it up Mm -hmm. and I'll eat those and those are delicious. Yeah. Those are great. Very lean. Yeah. You know, the cheese obviously adds a little bit, but very lean option. But yeah, so all that to say, you don't have to get super hung up on the high protein snacks. Just look at your overall protein target. Most people's protein target is not ridiculous. And the the problem, I mean, we're going to talk about protein targets later in this episode, but here's a little spoiler. The estimates that you see online are almost guaranteed overkill, especially if you have a little bit of weight to lose. If you are not like jacked out of your mind and like you'll know (laughs) right if you're jacked out of your mind you'll know Mm -hmm. how many people do you think listening to this are jacked out of their mind one percent i five (laughs) percent absolute max it's not 90 percent it's not 90 percent of people listening to this are not jacked out of their mind yeah 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 so uh protein needs scale up as Mm -hmm. you have more muscle not as you have more weight. When we use the per weight measurement, I'm getting ahead of myself. I really am. But like, what? yeah. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> let's, let's just move on. Okay. All right. So why is protein important? And we will get back to the... Definitely. Yeah, we'll get back to that protein targets later. So why is important? Why is protein important for body composition or muscle growth? I think we skipped a section. I deleted it. Oh, I understand. <laughs> it felt like, I mean, it was just like, what is protein yeah, no, used for in the body? And we perfect. already covered that earlier. So I was like, yeah. eh, let's just, <laughs> good eye though. Okay. 
why is protein important for body composition or, and, or muscle growth? So for muscle growth during exercise, specifically strength training, we increase the, we put a stimulus on the muscle and, you know, assuming we worked hard enough, assuming we did enough volume. And when that happens, the muscle will send a signal to the brain. That's like, dude, we need to be more prepared for this. I'm, I'm really boiling it down, but let's just be <laughs> real simplistic with it. They're like, Hey, this guy or this gal is crazy. And that was really hard. And we need to be more prepared for this. And this is how adaptations in the body happen is we put a stressor on the body and our body is forced to adapt to it. I mean, that is just a beautiful design of the human body. It is why some people are more muscular because they've been lifting weights for a long time. Muscle growth is a small process or slow process. That's why some people are better at running because they've been running a long time. And so the body will adapt and get better at running. You know, somebody who's a couch potato versus somebody who's a marathon runner, they have drastically different adaptations. And so muscle growth is one of those adaptations where we put a stressor on the body, you know, lifting weights, and then we need to send amino acids to build the muscle back and bigger and bigger muscle size is one piece of strength. It's not like muscle size equals greater strength, although that is one part of it, but there's a lot that goes into strength, technique, neurological adaptations, limb length, muscle insertion for my physics fans out there. You got to think about like, if you are trying to pull, let's say there's a, a two by four on the ground. It's a heavy two by four and we attach a rope toward the bottom of it, you know, one end of it. And we try to pull it. It will take a ridiculous amount of force to pull it. Like if it's, you know, the, 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 the closer end to us versus if it's the far end of the two by four and we attach the rope there, we pull it, we're pulling that thing easy. And I'm saying like, if the bottom is like bolted into the ground and we're trying to like pull it upward, you know what I'm yep, saying? Yep. Does that make sense? Like an yep. arcing motion off the ground. Yeah. And so, you know, what's funny is like our muscle is so much stronger than our body mechanics allow it to be mm -hmm. because it's never pulling. Like, look at your bicep, like listener, look, look down at your bicep right now. The bicep does not attach down at the wrist. It attaches basically right at the elbow joint, like just below the elbow joint. And so the amount of effort that it needs to actually pull in order to get like a dumbbell curled up is a ridiculous amount of force. It is a ridiculous amount of force. So the actual like mechanical, this is a very nerdy tangent, but the actual mechanical capabilities of our muscle is so much greater than what our anatomy allows. It's unbelievable. So in, in the human 2.0 update, I'd really <laughs> like that to be fixed. <laughs> yeah. All right. So very important for muscle growth. Also important to note that of the two stimuli that go into muscle growth, lifting weights is one and protein intake is two. There are other stimuli, but those are like the major two. So if you can just hit them with the one, two combo, you lift weights, you eat enough protein, you're going to be in good shape. And if somebody's like, Oh, I feel like I'm doing that, but I'm not gaining muscle. I bet you're not look I bet you're not zooming out enough. Mm -hmm. I bet you are thinking that in two weeks you are just gonna turn into muscle magoo. <laughs> you're just gonna like and it's just not realistic. Yeah. I mean, if you if people look at me, they're probably like he's strong, he's muscular, but not like jacked out of your mind muscular. Now you might, you're my wife and you love me. And so you're going to say, no, you are jacked out of your mind, which I love you. You're great. But like, I've been lifting since 2012. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those years, you know, they weren't perfect with my lifting. Sure. They weren't great with my nutrition. There were maybe, I mean, how many times did I take an entire month off? Twice? Maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Like it's not, it has not been very frequently that no. I've taken more than a month off. Right. Yeah. But not always perfect, not always optimal. And so like the last like three, four years have been very locked in with my nutrition, <laughs> with my training. And even still, it just takes a lot of time to put on muscle. So much time to put on muscle. I would bet in the, like very roughly just looking at my body composition, I've probably put on about this is a ridiculous number that I was talking to uh, my buddy Bennett yesterday about. 
but my senior year of high school, 2012, I was 120 pounds. Today I'm 165 pounds. My body composition in terms of like my leanness is roughly the same. So I can somewhat extrapolate that I've put on about 45 pounds of muscle, which is absurd <laughs> to think about, but like a relatively decent rate of like a great rate of muscle growth for a beginner would be like one to two pounds per month would be like, whoa. Yeah. But you have to consider that that is one to two pounds, not just in your chest, not just in your glutes, not yeah. just in your hamstrings, not just in your abs or your, you know, your shoulders or your back. It is your calves. It is your hamstrings, your quads, you know, your glutes, mm -hmm. your adductors, your abs, your, 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 your pecs, your biceps, your triceps, your forearms, your shoulders, your back. Like there's so much, you know, mm -hmm. that protein or that muscle growth is spread across that it takes a very long time to see. So if you feel like you're doing the right stuff and you're not seeing muscle growth, dog, slow down, zoom out. If you started a business, would you expect to be making seven figures by end of year? If you are, you're delusional, <laughs> a little bit of the Delulu and you need to, you just need to you get, need to get your brain straightened out. <laughs> muscle growth is very slow, yeah. long tangent. Okay. The other part of why muscle growth or protein is important for body composition, muscle growth is the body comp composition side. So muscle burns slightly more calories at rest than body fat. Mm -hmm. Both are technically like metabolically active or they, they require energy to upkeep. So increased muscle mass can contribute to fat loss and therefore increased or improved body composition, but it's not much. Right. This is drastically overstated. You know, what's funny. It's drastically overstated for a while by like science-based people. And then science-based people realized that we were drastically overstating it. And so then they started drastically understating it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm here to put us back in the middle. <laughs> so muscle burns... So, the, okay, body fat burns about two calories per pound per day. Muscle burns about six calories per pound per day. So we're talking a difference of four calories per pound of muscle. Right. I've gained a ridiculous, let's just say 40, 40 pounds for math reasons. Let's say I've gained 40 pounds of muscle. That is 160 calories. Right. That's I, a lot. No. <laughs> 40 pounds of muscle? Well, yes, but I feel like 160 calories is... A pretty substantial amount when you consider know. like you can't just burn an extra 160 calories that easily you elsewhere. Walk, walk like a mile and a half two miles sure yeah either way but anyways that six calories per pound per day that is at rest and that doesn't tell the whole picture because your muscle when you know like let's say you go for a walk or you say you lift weights your muscle is still going to be active after actually using it. And so including that kind of like increased activity muscle adding, like t it might be closer to six to 10 calories per pound rather than just six. And so adding 10 pounds of muscle might increase daily expenditure by 60 to 100 calories. Like it's good. It's just, I don't think people fully appreciate the amount of time adding 10 pounds of muscle will take. Yeah. That could take depending on your genetics, depending on your training, depending on your nutrition, depending on your sleep, depending on your starting point, depending on your training level, that could take a year. Mm -hmm. That could take two years. That could take five years. Yeah. You know, elite bodybuilders, assuming they are not on copious amounts of steroids, which most of them are, uh, and they're open about that. You know, sure. the natural, natural bodybuilders are not obviously, but like the some people see bodybuilders and don't realize that they are on steroids. Yeah. And that is shocking. Yeah. The amount of people that are actually on steroids is so significantly higher than I thought even two years ago. Way higher than I thought. Yeah. Anyway. anyway. <laughs> yeah, adding 10, 10 pounds of muscle, that's going to take a lot of time. And I just... I'm not a fan of when people use muscle growth or cardio as a means to burn energy. I get that. Do it for your health. Right. Do it because you, whether it's the aesthetics, you know, you want to just like have a little bit more muscle because you want to have bigger glutes or a bigger chest or bigger shoulders, or you just like the way it feels that you like the way it looks. Do it for the aesthetics. If you want to do it for 
Hey, I want to be able to squat up and down off the toilet when I'm 90 years old. Do it for mm -hmm. that. Do it so that you can pick up your child when they are 30 or 40 pounds without mm -hmm. worrying about my body will break down. If I pick <laughs> up this child, they feel like a bowling ball times four, you yeah. know, do it for all the health benefits, you know, the heart disease prevention, the diabetes prevention, do it for those things. Why do you need it to be about, I just need to be a thin goddess. If you want to be a thin goddess, eat less food. Yeah. Track your calories. Look at your dietary intake and actually make adjustments that are sustainable and realistic in the long run. If you're just lifting weights and, and going, do, like, like doing your cardio, and I know it's like a means to an end, you know, mm -hmm. if somebody is lifting weights and doing their cardio and it, it's under the guise of calorie expenditure, is that the worst thing in the world? I don't know. I don't know if I'm like the ethics committee on this, <laughs> but I just think that it almost leads them toward a path of unsustainability. Mm -hmm. You know, if they that. don't see the results that they want in terms of exclusively the scale, I just feel like you're missing the bigger picture because yeah. you could add 10 pounds of muscle and lose 10 pounds of body fat. You're the exact same weight, but you're a drastically different person. Mm -hmm. You're going to be feeling better. You're going to be sleeping better. You're going to be moving right. better. You're going to be healthier. Yeah. And I also think there's just still some confusion for a lot of people about like, oh, if I want to lose weight, I need to hit the gym. Yeah. But the reality is majority of your weight loss needs to come from the way that you the eat. The kitchen. Yeah. Yes. hundred percent. Yeah. And speaking of, <laughs> you know, this next section is kind of funny that we're just going to segue into this, how we just talked about, I mean, we just kind of talked about like, please don't pursue, you know, it's not like don't pursue fat loss. That is not what I'm trying to say. No. I don't give a, a, a shit <laughs> about like what you want to, of course, like I pursue fat loss. Mm -hmm. I pursue, I just don't see the gym as the gym is a place where you create adaptations. You, you mm -hmm. create, you add the stimulus to create physical adaptations in the body. You support that with nutrition. You do not go to the gym and hope to lose weight because that is an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. Have we talked about the constrained energy model? I think we did on our weight loss episode. Not in this podcast. Episode. Not in this episode. Yeah. No, not I'm, but I'm pretty sure we did that. we've mentioned it in the yeah. past though. All right. That was episode one. So if you ever, if you ever want to look back at that, like, just trying to do cardio for weight loss, that is a very uphill battle. Your body will reduce your energy expenditure in other ways to compensate for that. So just focus on nutrition. All right. Anyway, let's move on. How does protein improve fat loss? So there are a few ways it does this. First, protein is just filling. Yeah. It just keeps you full. Yeah, that's the that's the big one, that's a, that's, I think. That's a very, very, very big one. That's probably the big one is mm -hmm. if you have six ounces of chicken at a meal, dog, you're going to be full. <laughs> you're going to be very, very, very full. Yeah. 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 There's also, I think it's important to kind of note, like consider like your leaner proteins when you're yes. approaching satiety. Yeah. Instead of like 80, 20 ground beef, yeah, go for like a 94, six or a 93, seven or something like that. You yeah. know, you don't have to get like a the, the leanest absolute option, but just like kind of look at where the low rocks, you know, right. low hanging fruit. That all also, rocks. Yeah. That'll also help if you are someone who realizes like, oh, I need to borderline double the amount of protein I'm eating in a meal. Yeah. Like if I'm going from three ounces of chicken to five, chicken's a relatively easy one. But if you're doing that with ground beef or steak, you know, you're, you're going to add up a decent bit of calories yes. on that. If you're looking at those less lean options, not mm -hmm. that you can't eat them. We eat ground beef and steak all the time. Yeah. But. All right. Next up is, so satiety is one of the ways that helps fat loss. The next way is thermic effect. So digesting protein requires more energy than digesting carbohydrates or fats. So this increases your overall energy expenditure. So your energy expenditure, I'll be real quick with this. It's made up of four parts, your basal metabolic rate, which is a resting metabolic rate, which is the amount of calories you burn at rest, not doing anything, laying in a bed, not blinking, like not, not, not talking, nothing just <laughs> laying there. It's the amount of energy required to keep us alive. Then there is the thermic effect of food, which I will talk about in a second. That's basically the amount of calories or energy needed to digest and process food. And then there's exercise activity, thermogenesis, which is like, and this is broken up into two pieces, intentional exercise, like, you know, going for a walk, running, 
lifting weights, stuff <laughs> like that, swimming, whatever. And then there's like the unintentional exercise activity thermogenesis, which is they, they call it non-exercise activity thermogenesis, NEAT for mm -hmm. short. And this is like me moving my hands around, pacing around the house, you know, anything that is unintentional, unplanned exercise, going for, going to the grocery store and pace, you know, yep. walk around there, stuff like that, doing the dishes, all things like that, whistling, you know, singing, you know, playing guitar, all requires energy. So the thermic effect of protein, protein is about, I think it's, oh shoot, is it 20 or 30%? Can you get a fact check on that for me? Anyways, it's either 20 or 30%. I want to say it's 20. And then pro carbs and fats are about five to 10%. So what was it 25 to 30? Yeah. Okay. So 20 to 30, 25 to 30, I was in the right ballpark. So yeah, protein, you know, you eat hundred calories of protein, 25 to 30 calories roughly are mm -hmm. going to be used in the process and digestion. Whereas you eat hundred calories of carbs or fats, only five to 10 calories are going to be used in the process of digestion. So I wouldn't like trying to micromanage this. I wouldn't really like overthink this. It's just to say that like eating more protein, uh, it, you know, it helps. Sure. It's very filling. Uh, the, you know, it, it burns more energy. That's great. And then the uh, third way it helps uh, improve fat loss is muscle maintenance and muscle growth. So as mentioned earlier, increased muscle mass slightly boosts your energy expenditure or metabolism um, and helps burn more calories at rest. And if we are able to maintain or gain muscle during a fat loss phase, we are losing a higher proportion of that weight as body fat. You know, you lose somebody who's not eating enough protein. They are not lifting weights. They lose 10 pounds. What if eight of that is muscle? Right. And two of that is body fat. They have a worse body composition than when they started. And this is like, this is yo-yo dieting as a whole. Mm -hmm. It's like somebody loses weight. You know, if you try to lose weight too aggressively, too fast, you're going to be losing a higher proportion of body fat compared to muscle. Not always, but if you're, if you're not lifting weights, you're not eating enough protein mm -hmm. and you're trying to lose as fast as possible. Tough luck. That's a, that's a bad spot to be in. It is my highest recommendation that you try to maintain as much muscle as possible in a fat loss phase. It is so, so, so important. If we don't do that, if we don't lift weights, if we don't eat enough protein, if we try to diet as aggressively as possible, we are going to lose a higher proportion of muscle mass and our body doesn't want to give that up. Mm -hmm. Our body wants that back. So it will increase hunger, encouraging you to eat more. Hunger is just hard to, it's hard to fight against. And as you eat more, as when we gain weight, it's a proportion of both body fat and muscle but not the same proportion we lost it. So let's say somebody loses that 10 pounds. Eight of it is muscle. Oh, brutal. Eight of it is muscle. Mm -hmm. And then we gain back that 10 pounds. Probably eight of it is body fat. Nine of it is body fat. Right. We are in a such a worse place in terms of our health and our body composition. And it is even funny. And this is like what yo-yo dieting does is people <laughs> lose the same 10 and lose and then gain the same 10. And then, or they'll do like one of those fad diets where, you know, very restrictive. They can't stick to it. They do it. They lose a lot of weight. They're not lifting weights. They're not really watching their protein intake. You know, they, they lose 10 pounds, they gain 15. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they're in a worse place than when they started. I, I loathe these dietary programs that are so restrictive that it's just like, and for what mm -hmm. to make a buck at the cost of somebody's health. It's disgusting. It's, it's so shameful. And, and the people and the magazines that promote it. The magazines is, are crazy. This is a hot take. They should be imprisoned because yeah. some of those magazines are so dangerous. Yeah. I know. I mean, I don't think magazines are what they used to be as far sure. as like, you know, my mom used to have stacks, yeah. you know, of all of the magazines and the covers are so aggressive. Yeah. yeah. Lose, lose 40 pounds in one month. Like, and it's so predatory. Uh, yes, it's extremely yeah. predatory. It's it's Any, preying on people's insecurities. Yeah, anything that preys on people's emotions like that. Yeah. It's a little nasty. So, you know, if you're looking for the like the missing link, I honestly believe that the missing link for for so many people when it comes to long-term weight maintenance and healthy aging is lifting weights and eating enough protein. Mm -hmm. And if you want to make this the last time that you lose weight and you want to maintain it for a very long time, you need to do those two things, mm -hmm. lift weights, eat enough protein. And that is a, a great transition into our next section of how much protein. So, so then Alex, 
how much protein should I eat? Mm -hmm. So the recommended dietary allowance, the RDA, please do not skip past this part. Please do not just hear this and then check out. Do not pause the episode right after I say this, please, because I need to explain. There's going to be a massive, but I will continue. The RDA, the recommended dietary allowance for adults is 0.8 grams per kilogram or about 0.4 grams per pound. But this is the minimum needed to not be deficient. That is so right. important. You go below that, you're deficient. You're not in a good spot. If you are concerned with body composition, including fat loss, including muscle growth, we recommend a highly, highly, highly recommend shooting for a higher target. Mm -hmm. 0.7 grams per pound is a good starting point, maybe even as low as 0.6 grams per pound. Mm -hmm. I would go, I'd consider going up to one gram per, of protein per pound of body weight. And, and let's talk about sort of, let's talk about the, the breakdowns of like these different ranges down to 0 0.4, 0 0.7 to one, and potentially beyond that. Where do these things make sense? Okay. So 0 0.4, that is the recommended dietary allowance minimum to not be deficient. Definitely eat more than that. Like a hundred, I'm going, I never say a hundred. I yeah. never say everybody. I'm going to say 99.999999% of people should be eating more than that. The very small few are people who have a doctor's note and <laughs> a kidney disease Sure, that they need to be a little bit more careful. But if you have healthy kidneys, eat more than that. 0 0.7 to 1 gram per pound of body weight. This is recommended for individuals actively trying to build muscle or lose weight mm -hmm. either way or both. And then above one gram per, uh, of protein per pound of body weight, this won't necessarily be a bad thing and could be marginally ben more beneficial, especially in a fat loss phase to help maintain or even gain muscle. However, dietary sustainability and enjoyment are both extremely important. So don't feel like you absolutely need to do this. You know, it's kind of, mm -hmm. I personally do like, especially in a fat loss phase, yeah. I pump it up like, you know, one gram per pound a body weight for me would be about 165 grams, depending mm -hmm. on what weight I am at the time. I shoot for about 200 grams plus yeah. every single time. And it's just because, like I said, it's more filling, it burns more calories, and it helps me maintain muscle mass when I'm dieting. So yeah. that's important to me. Since protein intake is largely dependent on the amount of muscle you have, if you're overweight, let's say roughly 30 plus pounds to lose, that's not like an exact figure or anything sure. like that. That's just an arbitrary kind of number I've chose. It could be more realistic to use your goal weight for these calculations. So like, let's say you're like 220 pounds and you're not jacked out of your mind, you know, and you want to be like 170, use that for the calculation, then hit 0.7 grams times 170. You know, that'd be a great, great thing to do. If you can't reach the target of 0 0.7 grams uh, of protein per pound of body weight, just do your best. Yeah. The goal is progress, not perfection. Yeah. You know, find ways to incorporate more protein in your diet like increasing protein portion size at meals you're already eating, adding protein powders, shakes, bars, potentially adding some high protein snacks if you feel it's relevant. Yeah. The easiest way though is to just increase portion sizes, you know. Mm -hmm. That's it's just the easiest way. Yeah. Now, two important notes that I have on protein intake, quantity, and targets. If you're vegetarian or vegan, it is a very good idea to increase protein intake by about 20 to 30% above these targets. So, you know, do your 0.7 grams per pound and then add 20% to that. So if it's like, okay, I should be eating hundred grams, I would shoot for 120 or 130 grams. This is because plant source proteins are often less bioavailable, meaning they are harder to absorb. So you just, vegans and vegetarians need to add a little bit more. And my other point on this is as we age, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 60 years old, anabolic resistance starts to happen where we don't absorb protein as well as we used to. So it is at this point that I would start hiking up your protein intake beyond that 0.7 grams per pound. And I personally will be shooting, and I would say this for my mom, I have told this to my mom, mm -hmm. my dad, like your parents, when they get to that age, mm -hmm. uh, I'd be shooting for one gram per pound of body weight and, and keep I think that's a pretty good target. I don't necessarily know if you need to go above that, but again, use your goal body weight. Like if you, if you, if you're overweight or, you know, you're dealing with obesity, then, you know, use goal body weight for that because it it's just might be, it's not like it's going to be a bad thing. It's just marginally less beneficial at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did I cover, I think I covered everything on targets. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Cool. Also, I'll just add one note. I think people hear one gram of 
protein per pound of body weight. Obviously, like you can go down to 0.7 and that feels like a really large number. You know, if you weigh 150 pounds, it's 150 grams worth of protein per day. I really think if you spend a little bit of time meal planning for your week, and I'm I'm not saying that to like belittle anyone who's not hitting their protein target. There are definitely days where I'm like, oh, I'm pretty low. But yeah, I think if you spend a little bit of time planning your meals for the week, you can you can make that really manageable without making huge sacrifices or changes to your diet as is. Yeah. The power of pre-planning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when I'm in a, like a a diet phase and especially (laughs) if it's, I'm getting toward the tail end and it's getting harder, I'm dealing with hunger. Mm -hmm. I will, the night before I will pre-plan, just take 10 minutes to just be like, Hey, what do you think we're doing for lunch? What do you think we're doing for dinner? And I'll just start plugging things in. And then I have like a plan that I can work with throughout the day. And it it just, yeah, it, it adds up a lot. Yeah. And you know, we say the doubling your protein at meals is the easiest way. Honestly, adding in a protein shake is also very easy. So simple. Super lean, super, super, yeah. super lean. Basically the leanest option that you can get. Yeah. So there are definitely like and double just scoop having it. Yeah. double scoop it. Instead just of having those on scoop, hand. Twenty grams, go for forty grams. Go yeah. for a scoop and a half at thirty grams, you know? Like that is yeah. Somebody's protein goal is, you know, hundred grams of protein or something like that. You can, yeah. you're almost nailing half of it just there. Yeah. So I I think those two things can go a really long way if you are someone who's feeling really overwhelmed by like, I am not anywhere close to hitting that. I want you to go on. I know you have a tangent locked and loaded for this. It's not (laughs) written down, but I know it's there. The protein, the proteinification of all (laughs) foods, the healthification (laughs) of all foods. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think Danielle even just had a post on this for the, the Kodiak cakes. When you go to the grocery store and you see that things are labeled as protein packed, or if you are like, oh, I want to make cookies tonight and you like Google a recipe or you're looking at your favorite influencer, their recipe, and it's like, oh, add in two scoops of protein powder instead of half of your flour. Your favorite foods do not have to contain copious amounts of protein. (laughs) Not everything needs to be a protein source. It's totally fine. Our favorite desserts that we make do not contain. Dude, I'm not eating a protein. high protein cheesecake. <laughs> no. Just give me a damn cheesecake. I'll have a yeah. protein shake aside of it. I and I I get it from the perspective of like if you are newer to weight loss or you have this goal and it's feeling so daunting and you hear, "Oh, you really need to watch your protein. Like you need to hit these protein targets and oh, you have to be you have to hit your calorie goal." And you're just like new to this world. I get where the sentiment comes from. Like it, it can feel very overwhelming. Yeah. Just eat the cookie Just recipe. The cookie. You don't have to get rid of eggs no. from your cro- pro or from your cookie recipes. You don't have to get rid of the flour. You don't have to use like applesauce instead of you know like you can have. Plus it's just size. more realistic and sustainable because if yeah. you're always eating a shitty version of the food <laughs> and you're craving like the nice version of the food, like the more yummy version of the food, right. it's like just how long – dietary sustainability, especially if you're somebody who has a lot of weight to lose. If you're somebody who has five pounds to lose, whatever. It doesn't yeah. – you know, like you, you can really just like – yeah, you can be a little bit more strict. You can be a little bit more, you know, this is a short-term thing. If you have sure. like a lot of weight to lose or if you've struggled with your weight for a long time – you need to tailor your dietary habits, your nutrition, your nutrition habits and your exercise habits to a point that is long-term sustainable, mm-hmm. not just for like a month, three months, six months, 12 months for the rest of your life. Yeah. Because if you've struggled, if you're 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, and if you struggled with weight for the last five, 10, 20, 30 years, you need a lifestyle change. Right. Exactly. That is not going to come with fucking high protein <laughs> cookies. Yeah. If you are truly looking for a strategy to like adjust the calories on a dessert just make your portion smaller if you're making cookies in in your recipe well well, even if your if your recipe says that this is going to make 15 cookies just make them smaller and make 20 like that's going to go a really long way you're still going to enjoy the exact same food it's just going to be slightly smaller slightly lower calorie but yeah the this whole push of like and i i post recipes that are higher protein and you know like are for the purpose of hitting a protein target. So like, I don't want to bash myself indirectly, but 
we don't, we can we can relax a little bit on the high protein yeah. recipes. Not everything needs to have protein powder in it. No, if we you were can, doing protein pancakes for a while, and those yeah. were like decent. Yeah, those are those totally were fine. fine. Especially if you're if there's a recipe you like that protein kind of like adds a little bit of flavor to it. Yeah, th- because that's, if it doesn't that's, make it significantly worse, like right. If it's a worse right. version, that's not a good trade off. Yeah. All yeah. right. Let's move into how should I split my target across the day? So you have your total protein intake that we calculated, you know, five, 10 minutes ago. Now let's talk about how you split that up. So let's say you're shooting for hundred grams. All right. So a study published in December of 2023. So a very recent study at the time of this recording, honestly, this was a borderline landmark study. This was a big deal in my world. It was titled, The Anabolic Response to Protein Ingestion During Recovery from Exercise Has No Upper Limit in Magnitude and Duration in Vivo in Humans. And so in vivo just means it's in, it's not like in a Petri dish. It mm. is in like a, like a human being or, or in, a, in a living creature, I should say. And okay. so they, then they clarify in humans. So this study found exactly what the title suggests. There might not be an upper limit to how much protein we can benefit from in a single meal. There was this old kind of like bro myth that I honestly thought was dead, but it's still going around because I've had people ask me it. What happens? You know, can I eat more than 30 grams of protein in a meal? Is that wasted? Mm -hmm. First off, it was already a no, but this study showed that it is like unequivocally a no, like the biggest no. This study had people eat 100 grams of protein in a meal. They compared that to 25 grams. I'm pretty sure it's 25 grams of protein. But anyways, <laughs> they com- they compared that. So they had uh, people eating 100 grams of protein and they put these like tracers to find what was like happening yeah. with it. And they found that there was an elevated uh, muscle protein synthesis and it went on for, I think it was 12 hours. They had yeah. elevated muscle protein synthesis. So very, very solid stuff there. And so all this is to say is that what we have been saying is just more true than ever. That total daily intake will always be more important than timing. That said, if somebody's like, I can time it out though. Sure. So what would be optimal for me? I still believe that the most optimal way, if you're you know really concerned about crossing your T's and dotting your I's would be to split your daily protein target into three to four meals mm-hmm. and split that, you know, put three to four hours between each meal. Mm -hmm. So the three to four number, three to four meals per day, three to four hours between each meal. This will allow muscle protein synthesis to spike and then come back down and then spike again and then come back down. And, you know, Dr. Lane Norton, Mm -hmm. so bio lane on Instagram and like YouTube and stuff. He did his research. I'm pretty sure his PhD was on leucine, Mm -hmm. which is one of the amino acids and thought to be kind of like the light switch for muscle protein synthesis, like it turns it on or off. And I shouldn't say turns it on or off. It, it turns it, not a light switch on off, a dimmer switch yeah. ramping it up. And so there is a point where leucine maximizes muscle protein synthesis and that's called your leucine threshold. I used to have this number memorized. I think it's like 0. 0. 0.205 grams per pound of body weight is how much leucine you want. Don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. If you're getting like 20 to 40 grams of protein in a meal, you're probably maximizing it, especially if you are eating an animal source, which Mm -hmm. are almost always higher in leucine. But he looked at, well then, okay, if we want leucine to be high, why don't we just have like basically a leucine IV drip essentially? Sure. And what they found was that was actually worse for muscle growth. You actually want it to dip down. Mm. And and, and I, I think of it as like a trampoline. Like when you go low, you bounce really high. Yep. So that's what we want to do here. But again, that is what is optimal. It doesn't mean that is what is optimal in the grand scheme. If we are in a vacuum, if we are a bunch of robots, but like if you just enjoy eating one or two meals, all good. I will say if you're trying to do 100, 120, 140 grams of protein in one meal, it's a lot. good luck. Yeah. Yeah. I think when it comes to how you should split that target, I think managing hunger is going to be yeah. like a bigger yeah. For factor. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay. Kidney health. So this is a common one. Like, oh, aren't high protein diets bad for kidneys? And if you have a kidney disease, yeah, you should talk to a doctor. You you should talk to a nephrologist, something like that. But a study from 2018, if you are healthy, all good. A study from 2018 titled changes in kidney function do not differ between healthy adults consuming higher compared with lower or normal protein diets. A systematic review and meta-analysis by DeVry and colleagues 
looked at 28 studies with over 1,300 participants, and they found, quote, our analysis indicates that high protein intakes do not adversely influence kidney function on GFR in healthy adults. So basically just saying that like, no, it's all good. You do not have to worry about this. And they have tested very, very high protein intakes for a very long time and in different studies. And as long as you do not have any kidney issues, any kidney disease, all good. So then why not just eat as much protein as possible? Two things here. First, sustainability of a diet. If you are eating 200, 300 grams of protein a day, you might just hate your life a little bit. Yeah, you and, might get really sick of chicken. <laughs> and like some, but some people might really enjoy that. Sure. But if you don't, don't feel like you have to force it. If the difference of lowering your protein intake from like a, I don't know, like it always depends on how much muscle they have, uh, their body yeah. weight and stuff like that. So I don't want to give out like concrete numbers, but just like, don't feel like you have to push it to one gram per pound of body weight and beyond if 0.7 grams per pound is so much more realistic and you enjoy your diet so much more because right. diet enjoyment and workout enjoyment, I should say exercise enjoyment as a whole, both dietary and exercise enjoyment will push sustainability. Mm -hmm. And if you can enjoy it, you will be able to sustain it. And that is the key for long-term health. And then the other side of this for why not eat as much protein as possible is it could just take away from your carbs and your fats mm -hmm. and fats. If people are eating enough protein, they're almost guaranteed getting enough fats. Yeah. So like a good fat minimum target is 0 0.4 grams per uh, pound of body weight. So like somebody who is 200 pounds, if they're getting 50 grams of fat, which is so easy to get, like you yeah. are just going to get that almost guaranteed. You're good. But for carbs, this is where it can get a little tricky because carbs are our body's preferred fuel source and it fuels our training, you know, gets stored as glycogen. And so if we are eating, like if, if there are diminishing returns, which there are diminishing returns in our protein intake as we get higher and higher and higher, if we're taking away from our carbs, that may Im impede our training a little bit. So it's just kind of like this balancing act of, you know, ultimately I would just consider the sustainability of your diet though. Okay. And then last thing I want to touch on is BCAAs. So BCAAs are one of the greatest scams in the supplement industry. Yeah. <laughs> they are an inferior product to protein powder in literally every single way. They only contain three of the essential amino acids where a protein powder is a complete protein. So it contains all of the amino acids. If you were like, yes, but BCAAs, I enjoy the flavor because they're usually like a fruity juice and you know oh, things like okay. that. You're like fruit punch and blue raspberry and stuff like that. I'm going to show how much I don't really know about supplements. Are uh -huh. they, I thought they were pills. Are they like a, you might be able to get them in pills, oh. but they're just like a powder. I understand. Okay. Yeah. Like blue raspberry and stuff I like understand. that. Yeah. You know, like bomb pop and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so people will say like, you know, or supplement companies will say like, Oh, these help out with your recovery. So does protein, <laughs> but better. Yeah. You know, and I, there are people I've, I've worked with clients that have been like, they've almost like placeboed themselves into being like, no, it, I think it really helps me in my recovery. How would you know? Yeah. It's such a, it, it just like, how would you be able, have you objectively <laughs> measured that? Or are you just like I'm making yourself feel better because right. you bought this product and you want to yeah. believe in it, which is a logical fallacy, but one that like, I understand. I empathize. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Placebo is a crazy Placebo phenomenon. Placebo is crazy. Yeah. yeah. So BCAAs literally not worth your money and, and not worth your time unless you're like uh, one. I like uh, the only situation is if you enjoy overpriced fruity juice. That is the only situation. Mm -hmm. And if you like throwing away your money, and if you do like throwing away your money, throw it at us. <laughs> throw it to me, because I'll catch it with open hands, two hands. I'll catch it. <laughs> Should start a BCAA line. <laughs> never. No, I would never. I would never no. contradict my morals in that no. way. If you ever see me promoting BCAAs, know that I have completely sold out. <laughs> All right. That's it. I'm done. We're That's good. It. Yeah. As a quick outro. Again, if you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a five star rating if you have not already. Like, subscribe, share, do that whole thing. Screenshot and share in your story. Tag us at Alex Timmy Fitness. Or Meals with Maddie. Not or, and, and. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you're looking for a low cost training program where I put my best foot forward and try to optimize this stuff for you so that you don't have to, you just show up to the gym, open up the app and there's a workout there for you. Good to go. You're going to get 
faster gains than you've probably ever gotten in your entire life, join the A-team. There's a seven-day free trial. Try it out for, I'd say try it out for a week, but realistically, try it out for like three weeks. And if you are not significantly stronger on that third week of training, shoot me a DM and I'll, I'll help you out because you just will be. I won't yeah. get any DMs about that. And then the other thing is Ford Forever. That is my other paid product. And also one-on-one -on -one coaching is back. So yeah, not, not yet, but it will be in the next like two months. So look out for that. I do have a wait list in my Instagram link in bio. If you're curious about that, it also has prices, like a rough price range. So yeah. Okay. That's it, everybody. Anything else you want to add here? No. Awesome. I think so. Take care, everybody.